Welcome to Ando's Thinky Time Podcast. I really appreciate you listening to this. Um, I hope you really enjoy this episode. It's going to be a good one. If you'd like to listen to exclusive podcasts or see my work behind the scenes with my music or my paintings, just roll over to patreon.com slash andotheartist. There you can subscribe and see things before they come out. Um, It's been really a fun thing. Thank you to all the people who are subscribed over there. Um, Those people really make my life work a little better. (laughs) A lot better. Today's episode features a guest we've had on the show before. Um, She is running for Congress from our area. Her name is Dr. Karen McCormick. She's a great lady, and um, I'm happy to have her back on the show. Um, It's just fun to sort of catch up with somebody that is running for Congress and kind of see, I don't know, what's going on in their process and, you know, catch up. It was a really great episode. Um, I hope you enjoy it, and um, thank you very much. Uh, be sure to look me up on YouTube, uh, Andy Epler or Ando the Artist on YouTube. There are all of the episodes from this podcast just waiting there for you to listen to. And um, golly, that would help me if you wanted to go listen to them there. That's awesome. Thank you very much for listening. Enjoy the show. in that far. (laughs) Um, You're definitely not a type A individual. No, no. You know what it is? Uh, I'm I'm definitely a type B kind of guy, but um, I run a business and I have to do all the stuff. So I I kind of, um, I believe the goal for any being should be balance, you know, because that's the message I receive from the universe when I'm looking at the world. I recognize that there's a certain sort of, I don't know, is this a mystical idea? It's kind of stupid, maybe. Balance is real. You know, that's what I think. Yeah, yeah. So, I want to be able to think on different levels. There's like a naturally masculine kind of way to think. There's maybe a naturally feminine way to think. I want to balance that in my world, too. Mm -hmm. So, that's very much part of what I'm trying to do. You know, I want to project positivity and professionalism, you know. Mm Mm-hmm. And in the arts, you know, <laughs> it's like I've, I've been in, I've been in, uh, I've done a lot of work organizing artist groups and stuff like that. And they say you can't, you know, herd cats, right? But I've found when you're working in an economy, a, a working healthy economy, anyway, you can't herd cats, but you can move their food. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. You can sort of incentivize good behavior. Yeah, that's a good analogy. I like it. I'll try not to abuse it and stretch it too far. I'll let it go right now. (laughs) It's nice to have you back, Dr. McCormick. Thanks for making time. You bet. It's nice to be back. Good. Oh, thank you so much for saying so. Yeah, and I'm I'm trying to remember when it was. I know it was winter. It was episode one of this show. It was it was very much winter, Mm -hmm. and now it's very much summer. It must have been in January um, or February. I had the house to myself. Yes. Um, so, Except for the cat. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, yeah, yeah. That that was months and months ago. Since then, a lot's happened in your yeah, world. Yeah, you wanted to hear the story of what's happened since then, and that a tremendous amount has yeah. happened since then. Well, geez. Not that. only you know personally, but the campaign and throughout the district Mm -hmm. there's just been so much so let's start with your campaign how are things going sure things are fantastic so at that point in time we were really focused on the primary Mm -hmm. number one step was to get on the ballot yep which we did in april and then to go on and get past the primary which was the end of june as many of you know and that was a tremendous boost 
to our campaign, the people that have worked so hard. We built a, an incredible team of volunteers and people that were willing to get on the phone and make tremendous number of hundreds and hundreds of phone calls to people across this district, knock on doors, letting yeah. people know. What was great about this particular election in Colorado, this was the first time that unaffiliated voters were legally allowed to participate in a primary election. Yeah. So that offered up a great opportunity, but also a lot of confusion. Yeah. And so we found it... Because uh, I'm one of those unaffiliated voters. Sure. I, it's lots of people that I know, even family members yeah. are as well. And so it offered up an opportunity for us to not only educate the voters on their ability to participate, but what that was going to look like. Yeah. Because uh, each county throughout our state had a different way of educating their voters. You know, the, the ballots go out by county. They don't go out statewide. So each county had its own kind of educational piece that it was hmm. trying to get to their voters. We have 22 counties in our district, the 4th Congressional District. And so we took it upon ourselves to be part of that uh, that ability to communicate to the voters, to educate them. Yes, you get to participate. This is what's going to happen. You have to choose one ballot or the other. You know, this is my candidacy and what I'm about. So it was kind of twofold in that respect. And I think that helped us really draw in some of those uh, unaffiliated voters that wanted to participate early on. And it helps us in the general election as well, because now we've already messaged to those unaffiliated voters. We were able to get to them early. The introduction's been made. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. nice. They already, you know, many of them were glad to participate in this primary. So we won all 22 counties. That's so pretty impressive. My campaign <laughs> won all 22 counties by a very large margin, 65 to 35, so over 30 points. Very, very encouraging that yeah, our is. message, my message, is working. It's resonating with the voters. They're, they're wanting to see, um, and you had mentioned before we started recording about balance. Mm -hmm. And that resonates with me because that's kind of who I'm all about. Mm. It's all about how do we bring a more collaborative approach to government, to policy making? How do we, how do I go out there and bridge this divide? Because we all feel that there's this big divide in our uh, in our state to a certain degree, but more so in our country. Mm -hmm. And as Americans and as Coloradans, how do we bridge that divide rather than further drive us apart? Yeah. How and do so, we discourage tribalism, yes. you know, and automatic kind of thinking? And move more towards a functional, healthy democracy. Yeah. So That's why I'm an unaffiliated voter. I get it. You know? <laughs> yeah. I just I never want to have sided up with either side. I'm, right. I'm fiscally conservative and I'm socially liberal. I think That's almost me. everybody is. That's me. You know? Yeah. After running my own business for over 16 years, you have to be fiscally responsible. You yeah. Know, we had a big budget. I had 24 employees that I had to pay every two weeks. And it's really important that you make sure that your income and your expenses... Uh, are in line. Yeah, so man. That it's you, like business 101. It's really simple. and. Uh, but at scale with the government, exactly. it becomes a problem. It becomes a problem. Because there's so problem. many interests, so many people screaming in this little room that makes exactly. the decisions. Exactly. And too much tribalism. Right. When you're part of a tribe, you sort of like give away part of your thinking to yeah. the group. You, you get caught up in um, that that fervor. That's right. Exactly. And Somebody else must have thought about this. Mm -hmm. And so I agree with them. Mm -hmm. And it, this seems like a popular, you know, people are passionate about whatever this is and you get caught up in yeah. that. But that fucks up a democracy. Yeah. If you're not doing your own thinking. Yeah, we forget about critical thinking. That's we it. forget about, and I think people can be too quick to either jump on board or to make a judgment. 
Yeah. And and that's how I am different. I am not going to be that person that says, yeah, let, that's a great idea, let's do it. I want to know the pros, the cons, who's affected, who's benefited, who's going to benefit from this, you know, what are we missing? I think good decision making takes time to get there. And if that's you're right. going to have legacy uh, policy or legacy uh, laws that are written into uh, on a statewide level or a federal level, you have got to have input from all sides. And that's what we've gotten away from is the ability to talk to each other, to listen with respect, and to work through those problems together. You know, mm-hmm. when it's one side or the other that's always making the decisions without any input from the other side, uh, these are the these are the policies that get enacted that don't last. Yeah, they don't last because we didn't listen to all the representatives. We didn't listen to all the the ins and outs of the issue. So that that's how I'm different, at, at least from our present representative. Yeah, and I'm gonna stand up for what's what's right and make sure I listen to all sides before making a decision going forward. You have to, it's your responsibility in that job to fully digest an idea, I think. But I think it's a troublesome thing, friend, because I'm so disappointed so often by the kinds of people that have these jobs. And it seems like it they don't represent Americans, largely. They represent a small group that paid to put them there, even though the job of, of congressperson, uh, it takes a community to get you there, or you could just spend the money or whatever and take mm-hmm. a bunch of pack money and all this, mm-hmm. um, and kind of just almost cheat your way into a, a seat in a democracy. Buy your you way know? in. Yeah. It's a representative republic, but like a lot of these people represent a, a bank instead mm-hmm. of a community, you know? Uh, I think that's a real problem. It is a real problem that a, particularly a representative that gets in office and really either never had sight of why it, why it is they were there or who it is they're supposed to be representing. They lost the connection to the people. And you're right, you are there to represent and that means that unless you're out meeting with constituents, unless you're out listening to every county of your district, you're listening to those that you disagree with, you're listening to those that you agree with, you've got to hear both sides, and you're willing to be open-minded enough to know when you just might be wrong. Being wrong and is being, one of the steps in being right. Exactly. <laughs> and, and being able to have a backbone and say, you know what? I was wrong. And this makes sense. And let's move forward with, with this idea. So our representative is not listening. He's not meeting mm-hmm. with constituents. He's not out there. He's not doing his job. Uh, we recently had a what's critical in our district i want to bring it back to a local issue Mm -hmm. our district is the number 11th district in agricultural exports in the country in the country so colorado's fourth congressional district is a huge agricultural district i have no idea beef wheat pork chicken i eat all that stuff yeah so we have We are a big driver of Colorado's economy and a big part of what happens nationwide and Mm -hmm. worldwide. So every four years, the farm bill comes around. So it's not a yearly event. It's every four years. It's critical for farmers not only to make sure they have proper crop insurance. um, When we have weather events from drought to hail, to whatever could happen that could uh, ruin their their crop for that year, to um, conservation properties of lands that are that are in place um, for critical reasons, um, for research and development dollars, for food assistance dollars. There's there's so many things that are part of this farm bill 
every four years, needs to be discussed, voted on. Our representative was not in town. It was a Friday, left early, was not in town. Mm. Yeah, you know, I I find that I find that inexcusable. This is your job. I know, man. To be there. Your job you're being paid the rest of your life for the work that you did in this little window. You know? And this is critical to our district. We are one of the few rural districts nationwide and we have got to have a representative that's gonna stand up for those rural issues especially agricultural issues that are such a big part of our economy. And um, that's going to be who I am. My undergrad degree is in agriculture. I was a dairy science major. It's been years since I really participated in any dairy uh, industry. But I at least understand that the farmers and ranchers of our district need someone that will at least be willing to learn what their issues are, learn... uh, you know, the pitfalls of what they're up against every year and how we can help on a federal level. It's tricky. I grew up around a bunch of farmers down in Lubbock, Texas, where I'm from. And uh, it's one of the few types of gambling that is necessary for society. You know, these guys have to put all the stuff in the ground. These dudes and ladies that are out there, they got to put the seed in. And if the rain doesn't come, you just, you just, you're in just trouble. Yeah, it's it's risk management. Yeah, you know it's risk management. It's trying to predict what's going to happen next year, and that you know that brings me to another part of what's happening. Uh, this, you know, on a national level, the trade markets and the tariffs that have been put in place are also affecting our farmers and ranchers in a big way because they can't plan uh, for being able to know. The, the possibilities of what their income is going to be in the future. Um, how are they going to make up for these uh, these world markets being shut down to them, yeah. not being able to export the beef, all the places, you know. And, and when we leave those holes open, when we don't have strong, fair trade agreements, other countries are going to fill the void. And then we're, yeah. we're not at the table anymore. That's we're their not job. There. We would do it if it was if yeah. we were in that position. We're not there to discuss it when yeah. we just pull out and not, and not fight for fair trade policies and making sure world markets are open for us. And, and again, that's, that's another reason why we need a representative that's going to represent the needs of this district. Yeah, I had no idea we were that significant in an agricultural perspective. Well, when you're in the more urban areas of our district, if you're really in a, you know, a medium-sized town like Longmont Mm. uh, or even Castle Rock or Parker, you may not be aware of of what's out there on the Eastern Plains. Mm -hmm. And there is just a lot of land. There's a lot going on. um, And these rural towns and, and... Industries need somebody that's going to pay attention to them. Yeah. Um, and I think that's where so many people that live in those other areas of our district feel left out sometimes. They feel that perhaps if you're from one of the towns, Greeley, Longmont, Parker, that you don't care about the rural towns. No, Fort Morgan, right. Yuma, Sterling, maybe. Lamar, mm. Lyman, Well, I do care, and I'm traveling to these areas, and I'm learning what I can about what they're up against and what their needs are. Lyman's way out there. Like, they must feel left out all the time. Yeah, yeah. Like, for me, uh, if we had any national debt or whatever, or we had some problem in Colorado, I'd sell that right to Kansas. Chop out a little bit. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. (laughs) Please be kidding. (laughs) Yeah. Well, you know, that brings me to another issue that's, that's... Kansas really? couldn't buy it anyway. Yeah. Totally good, good point. <laughs> um, not only people that live in uh, towns and cities, but in the rural areas, health care is still a huge, still, and yeah. will continue to be a huge concern on what's going to happen. What's happening now as far as the, the cost of health care continues to rise uh, the concern is accessibility as well in many of these uh, other areas that the rural health care clinics, the doctors and nurses and the patients that are depending on these rural health care clinics that have 
thrived and been able to continue to exist under our Medicaid expansion that we are as a state. The concern is if that goes away, all of that could crumble. And people being able to drive 30 minutes to a healthcare clinic, having to look at the possibility of needing to drive four hours is not acceptable to me. It's yeah. not acceptable that we as one of the most developed nations on this planet have not fixed this problem. It's and embarrassing. It's, it's, it's embarrassing and it's, uh, it's tragic in some cases that we, we can't supply the, the means and the ability for every person to be able to take care of their health needs. And, mm. and that's going to also be primary on my agenda is to get into Congress and to work with others to continue to fix this problem. You know, and as we started with the ACA and its ability to at least expand health care to so many mm. hundreds of thousands in Colorado and millions nationwide, but if our present administration or Congress continues to gut it by taking away subsidies, by taking away the mandate, we're, we're just knocking the legs out from under this thing and, and watching it die a slow death. And there certainly are a lot of problems involved with how the ACA uh, was set up. Uh, it's done a lot of good, but we need to move forward with this and not backwards. You know, yeah. we really need to put our heads together and move forward in a way that we make it stronger, more affordable and sustainable. Yeah. Uh, We've been letting a few people's greed keep us back from progressing just to like the baseline of the rest of the world in this area. For my case, I uh, had a divorce a few months ago and uh, a lot in my world changed. So like, I'm uninsured right now with my health insurance. That's not great, right? Because I have health problems, you know. I don't try and talk about it all on the podcast or whatever. It's a there are a lot of hilarious, beautiful stories in there, but I'll spare you. <laughs> uh, and so, like, I'm sitting here trying the, the health insurance market, you know, and like, uh, I was trying to get a quote for health insurance, right? So I put my ins my information in put some some website or whatever. How about an instant quote, Mister? I was like, that sounds great. No instant quote, you know. It, was, it turned out to be sixty phone calls a yeah, day. Yeah, they want to get you to a broker. <laughs> yeah, they want to get you. Yeah, they just took it. It was like, and it's, now you'll be bothered by everyone with a tie, a South. You know, yeah, or, it's not simple. No, it's not, and it should be. I, why isn't it? You know, it's like mm -hmm. car insurance wasn't like that. You know, I need car insurance. I can get a little quick quote. It's like the whole system is just fine. You pay yeah. some bucks or whatever. There it is. You know, and I think people don't understand too that the fact that. Every human being has a body, and every single body is going to need health care. Yeah. So it's so different than house insurance or car insurance or any of those other boat insurance where you could potentially not own a car. You're not yeah. going to need car insurance. You don't own a house. You're not going to need homeowner's insurance. Everyone owns a body. Yeah. Everyone's going to have something happen to them at sooner or later. So this is why this is a critical need for humankind, for our nation, and those costs of people that are uninsured, we all are paying for that anyway. Yeah, man. So what's a, what's a more fiscally responsible way to get that done? Ugh. You know, why, why doesn't that <laughs> phrase work and, you know, when you say it to yes, these people? <laughs> yes, how can we save money, cover more people, and have this, you know, be able to be... Uh, a system that works across state lines, yeah. which, you know, this that's another ridiculous uh, pr way that we have it set up right now. If you have health insurance in Colorado and you happen to be in Virginia, uh, you're, you're out of network. Yeah. You know, we are a transient society. We're always moving and visiting and driving places we need a system that, one country. that works throughout <laughs> yeah. the country and yes we're a republic we're a you know we're a federation of states but this this issue in particular needs to be uh it needs to be able to move with the person yeah, yeah. i got married in texas we moved to colorado we were still married 
You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. It wasn't like state by state and shit. I don't know mm-hmm. why health insurance feels like it can be that way. Yeah. And if your, I drive my car back car to Texas, insurance works that way. it's just no problem at all. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know? I'm looking at, across the aisle sometimes uh, at the Republican fellas and like, I feel let down often by politicians on both sides. Um, it's usually money that makes me get let down. Uh, they choose money over people. Mm-hmm. They're supposed to serve people. That, that Or party over people. Oh, that just makes me so itchy. And <laughs> I feel like I look at what their plan is for the world and they're like, well, we don't, you know, we don't mind if people need to drive four hours to get health coverage because we may not have to pay. They may not have to interact with the system at all because of the broken infrastructure. They could die on a, on a fucked up bridge on the way. And just kind of comb them right out of the system. That seems like their only real plan. Is it just to pile up a bunch of bad circumstance so that people don't make it to the hospital? Or what? What's? I don't know if they're really thinking <laughs> along those lines. I honestly, hope not. But, I really want to be yeah. a positive fella and assume the best in people. But I have to judge people by their actions and by the circumstance they put in play. I believe most people are good at the core and maybe their perspective is broken or something like that or maybe they're too selfish to enact that goodness outside themselves i want to believe most people think they're the good guy and are trying to do good things you know what you're even speaking to is this moral compass that i also think is inherent in most human beings this moral compass where we feel and we know on the deepest level what's right and what's wrong Mm -hmm. but those that have so buried their moral compass or so have had it overcome by the drug of power and money and position um, i think we've lost sight of that and and this is what has spurred me to even run is what happened to the moral compass of people and the backbone of when something is so obviously wrong out of bounds or or so uh just against human nature Mm -hmm. where are the people standing up and saying no i know this is my party doing this but this is so wrong and vote me out of office do what you need to do but i cannot stand to let this go without speaking out against it. That's what I'm missing. Where is that? Yeah. Why don't why aren't we seeing more of that in our elected officials? Mm-hmm. You know, here and there you'll 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 hear from people and you want to cheer them on whether they're on your side of the aisle or the other. I'm, you know, yay Mr. Republican for standing up and and saying this this won't this isn't me. This isn't the party that I want to be a part of. But why does it take us cutting some, you know, uh, tax benefit for corporations for these dudes to put on a diaper before they go to the lectern and talk for 20 hours or whatever? Why can't it be like the issues Americans really seem to feel passionate about and then slip on your diaper and go do your 20-hour speech or whatever? You know what I'm saying? I get frustrated because there's extremism in the system, right? And that should be in balance, right? We like extremism. You know, that's not terrible when it's mixed in and in balance, you know? I just, I don't understand why we can't find the balance, especially in the healthcare market, between uh, competition and community. That's the balance we try and strike, I think, when hoping to make good laws in in our country. There's a balance between... um, Iron sharpening iron in a competitive kind of way. But if you keep doing that all day, both those pieces are just fucked up forever. You know what I mean? So it's like, at some point, they're sharp. Now do something. Whittled down to nothing. (laughs) Yeah. Well, coming back to balance, too, and when we're talking about our elected officials, what I'm encouraged to see is, and a lot of people don't know about this particular caucus in the House of Representatives, There is a caucus of House members called the Problem Solvers Caucus. Sounds good. Sounds good, right? What is it? They They kill people that don't vote with the oil companies. No, they are a group of congressional representatives that are equally represented from the Republican Party and the Democratic Party. Mm. You can be an independent in there, I'm, I'm sure. 
And you cannot join this caucus unless you go find a reasonable, collaborative person from the other side of the aisle to join mm. with you so that it's always in balance. Right now there's 48 members. They have um, a overall agenda that are very specific uh, policies that they want to address. The budget, I'm not going to remember them all, uh, mm-hmm. unfortunately, right now. The budget is one of those. Yeah. Where it takes bipartisan Oh, the, uh, an inf- uh, uh, a robust infrastructure bill mm-hmm. for our country. Um, yeah, the other two, I'll, I'll have to look them up. Yeah. The, the idea behind this, though, is back to balance. Mm-hmm. It's back to balance is these members of Congress uh, meet weekly. They respect each other. They listen to differing opinions um, with respect and, and decency and agree that if they come up with a solution to a problem and 75 or 80 percent of the entire caucus is behind this, so it's it's not just 51 percent, it yeah, has right. to be... It's not a squeaker. Uh, exactly. Then they will all get behind it. And this is how you develop what I was speaking about like, earlier, ugh. legacy policy. Yes. Policy that the majority of the this representative group. And so if we can grow this type of caucus in the House of Representatives, of course, there's 435 members, right? So this group mm-hmm. of 48 is relatively small. Yeah. But if across this country during the 2018 election here, this midterm election, if we can... In, Uh, get into office, more open-minded, collaborative type people from our state and from all all the elections across our our nation and get into Congress with this this, uh, viewpoint, this perspective that, yeah, I am here to represent the people, it's about the people, it's it's, it's, uh, country before party, (laughs) all of that then we may be able to get our uh, this body of our government back to where it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be an equal branch of the government. It's part of the checks and balances, and they have fallen short on that obligation. They're not doing their job. Uh, they're in charge of the budget. They're in charge of uh, making sure that the ins and the outs match up as best they can. Um, adding to the deficit again last December, um, I, I call them out on that one too, as being completely fiscally irresponsible. So if we can get to that point where we are back to a functional democracy, where we're working together to get things done, um, but I think it's going to take some cleaning up of the house. I mean, yeah. really, we've got to get more people in there um, more problem solvers, please. More problem solvers. They should change the name of that caucus because that, that's a great <laughs> name. They ought to change it to uh, what the American people actually want us to be doing, comma, you vultures, is what they should change. Perhaps, <laughs> or, the, uh, <laughs> or the let's get back to a real democracy caucus. It's just so simple. Yeah. Why, it is. why can't they it just is. like go there and do a simple job of like, fi- of, of, it's like a business agreement. You Everybody, like when I approach... Uh, a venue about a gig. I can't just ask for a lot of money and then do a little gig and leave. There's this whole understanding of you need to benefit and I need to benefit. My benefit can't outweigh your benefit or you go out of business. You know, if it goes the other way, I go out of business. The goal is for us to both stay in business and benefit from each other. Well, the goal of our, (laughs) the goal of our government as it was set up is to be by the people, for the people, and of the people, mm-hmm. right? So what's gotten lost is the people. No <laughs> so shit. if we're going to have a government, which we are, I mean, that's, that's the whole basis of the formation of this great country of ours. If we're going to have a government, then don't we all agree that it should be a functional government? Mm-hmm. And it's not functioning in a healthy way at this point in our history. It doesn't look to me, from my perspective, it is of the people, the people created it, it is for the people, 
It doesn't look like it's being run by the people. It looks like it's been run by the part of the 1% that is interested in this business that is tricking people in the government. Well, you know? yeah, there's just a huge disconnect between doesn't what, look the like people, America. what the people want and what the people need mm -hmm. and their ability to translate those wants and needs in a voice that gets heard in Washington, D.C. Yeah. There's a huge disconnect there. Yeah, and is. it's because our representative government has lost, and the people that have gotten there, many have lost touch with their purpose. That's it, man. And Ooh, that's, that's that, true. Has, that has got to change. And it starts right here in the 4th Congressional District in Colorado. There's a classic South Park episode. Yeah, I think you voting. mentioned this yeah. last time. <laughs> Douchebag versus turd sandwich yeah, is yeah. usually what it comes down to in an election. I think that is slowly changing as the information age kicks in, as more more people that look like what we love about America are actually running for these jobs, not just people that look like somebody that you owe money to or you know is going to come take your car or something like that. That's what most of these people remind me of. You know, I think uh, I think people become disenfranchised and. The only people that seem to be really going out to vote right now are radicalized people. We have radicals. We want people to feel strongly. But, like, in my opinion, Donald Trump looks a little too much like some things about America. Selfish, greedy, you know, angry, abusive. Those things are true of us as a culture as well. And until we really face who we are as a nation, I think it's going to be tough for us to really fix our government. Because the system is broken. A lot of us, a lot of normal folks that would run for office, they're not going to get anywhere near it, man. Well, that's me, though. And that's yeah, why. Yeah, that is. That's what I'm saying. That's why I still, if I didn't have hope and if I didn't have this vision of this turning around, I would not be here. So yeah. I do have hope and I do see a way to break through this. And I think. Thousands of others do as well, and it's really that occasion in January of 2017 when we had the Women's March mm -hmm. in our country and across this world that was a wake-up, and it wasn't just women attending. I mean, this no. was a huge event, a, a world, point for humanity. worldwide event. I was in Washington, D.C. with my three kids. Uh, I heard about that March four days after the election, and I said, we are going. I don't care if 50 people show up. I am that inspired, and I have that much concern for the future of this democracy that we are going to take to the streets. And so to be present in D.C. That, that day was so incredibly moving and hope-inspiring to see people like me that are now continuing to say, what else can I do? What else can I do? And they're getting out from behind their computers and they're, they are being activists and they're not necessarily all the way on the left, mm -hmm. you know, to combat all the way on the right. These are more of what I consider um, the people that want reason they want intelligence, they want facts back in the uh, public eye. These are the people that perhaps always thought we were kind of doing okay. You know, maybe maybe my p political party didn't win, but I never had this much concern right. for how are we going to exist 50, 100 years from now. I yeah. think there's enough concern across this nation that this is not how we survive as a country. This is not how we survive in the world when we um, lose face of who our allies are. There's so much concern that I think that we have more people engaged in wanting to vote or to participate in a way that maybe they hadn't before. Yeah. So Beautiful. I, I really do think that we have a shot at getting some of that balance back. Maybe not all in one election here in 2018, but we can yeah. make... We can make a big dent at it, yeah. and uh, I might have I might have said this uh, last time too, that I grew up in a Navy family. So my dad served oh, thirty years right. in the United States Navy. We moved every one or two years throughout 
my childhood, so I really never put down roots in any one place. So I grew up thinking of myself as an American um, because I was in too many states to think of myself as anything else. Uh Um, But he retired as a rear admiral. He was a fighter pilot. I know I have fighter pilot blood in me, and that's why I know I can fight for this. and for fighter pilot blood in (laughs) Fight for these people. But he used to give me... like a Charlie Sheen quote. I love (laughs) it. (laughs) Oh, don't compare me to Charlie Sheen. (laughs) Please. Um, But he used to tell me about... He was captain of an aircraft carrier, and it was USS America. And in order to... Uh, turn an aircraft carrier there's a lot that goes involved there's a lot of people that have to do their jobs Uh, there's a lot of planning there's a lot of navigation and like how you know what how are you got to take the weather into account but it's a slow process where you know where you want to go and then that ship just slowly starts to turn. Mm-hmm. You cannot turn an aircraft carrier on a dime. No, the turning would radius. <laughs> the turning radius is not that great. Yeah. <laughs> but you have to, you have to plan, and you have to have that goal in mind to get there. And that's what I think about. Uh, I'm going to take that analogy of the USS America, which was the name of the ship, as our country. We're talking about the United States of America now. Yeah. We're, we're getting off course. I want to help right the ship and get us back on course uh, so that we're not, we're not going all the way to the left and we're not going all the way to the right. We want to move this ship forward, and that's what I want to be part of. Yeah, beautiful. Well, as you may be able to hear, listener, it started to rain outside, bringing balance to the steamy hot day we were experiencing <laughs> earlier. Uh, Dr. McCormick, where can people go and find you online? Thank you for, for asking. Oh, it's so, one of my favorite questions to ask Favorite on this question. Show. So my full name is Karen McCormick, and the doctor part comes from the fact that I am a veterinarian, uh, 33 years practicing veterinary medicine. And you can find so much about me uh, at our website, which is www.mccormickforcongress.org. I think it's a good time to put a veterinarian in office because right now the president is a horse's ass no comment (laughs) (laughs) thanks for coming on my little show (laughs) thanks for having me it's great to see you again see that was a good episode it's worth having her back on um i don't like to just repeat guests very often um this is the only guest we've ever repeated um but you know it's an election year That shit matters. So thank you very much to Dr. Karen McCormick for coming on the show again. And uh, thank you very much for listening again, folks. Uh, See you next time.